Welcome adventurers to the Command Valley, where we explore the EDH format and provide you with the deck text, gameplays, and lots of other content to help you on your journey in Commander. Before we begin the podcast episode, I just wanted to give a shout out to Game Grid Lehigh, who is sponsoring this podcast, so big shout outs to them. For today's episode, we're going to be reviewing and covering the cards in the new Aquaria Commander 20 set. In this episode, we will only be talking about the new commanders from this set. We won't be talking about any of the reprint commanders, but we will be talking about all the new ones. We won't be talking about any of the new cards. Those will come in the next episode. So please stay tuned for the next episode where we talk about all the cards in the 99 that we think are powerful in commander. If there's anything that we miss on any of the cards that we discuss, feel free to let us know in the comments and maybe give your own personal takes on some of these cards. There's a lot of things that we are probably going to miss and we'd love to hear from you to see how you take some of these cards. And then please remember to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to be notified of all of our content when it's released. We post deck techs every Monday and we're going to be doing a lot of deck techs and upgrade videos for the commanders in this set and in the standard set as well. So a lot of stuff coming out this month for A you lot guys. of content, yeah. With all that out of the way, let's get into the first wave of the commanders and we're going to be going over the commanders from the Arcane Maelstrom deck first, which is the green, blue, red deck. So first up, we've got Kalamax, the Storm Sire. He is a one, a green, a blue, and a red for a legendary creature, Elemental Dinosaur. His abilities say, whenever you cast your first instant spell each turn if Kalamax the storm sire is tapped copy that spell you may choose new targets for the copy additionally he says whenever you copy an instant spell put a plus one plus one counter on Kalamax he's also a 4-4 I really like this card he's probably one of my favorite commanders from this set and I think he leaves a lot to build around as opposed to some of the other commanders you're going to get into in this deck. There are a lot of different ways that you can take him and I really enjoy this type of commander. If I were to build Kalamax the Storm Sire, I would want to put in high impact, low CMC instance. Cards like High Tide, which for one blue mana, you can make all of your islands produce double the amount of mana until end of turn. And with Kalamax, you're going to create double double. So it gets super crazy and out of hand really fast. You're also gonna to wanna to play cards like Factor Fiction, which a second copy of that gets you 10 cards deep into your library. Or you could play Dig Through Time, which gets you 20 cards deep into your library and lets you get four cards. That's a lot of cards that you can see. Firemind's Insight is another super cool card that I think is worth putting into this deck. At instant speed and for five, a red and a blue. You can search your library for an instant that costs three, an instant that costs two, and an instant that costs one. So when you cast that with Kalamax being tapped, you get to search for six cards that you can hand pick and put them right into your hand. That's a ton of value for just seven mana. That's kind of a high cost, but you definitely get your mana's worth out of that. This deck has a ton of viable win cons, from using an Aetherflex Reservoir to gain a lot of life and ping your opponents to death with 50 damage, to big huge red X spells such as Comet Storm and Star Storm, where you make a bunch of mana with your High Tide, dump it into that red X spell, and kill your opponents all at once. Another thing that I like about this deck is you can find ways of tapping Kalamax without actually having to go to combat. Vehicles are a super great way, other ways of tapping Kalamax down, maybe like you play a Cryptolith, right? Which turns Kalamax into a mana dork that he, he can then tap for his own spells. Another super cool card in this deck would be Wilderness Reclamation. It's an enchantment that costs three and a green, and at the beginning of your end step, you can untap all of your lands. That's super cool because you can spend your whole turn using all of your mana to cast a bunch of instants and sorceries and gain a ton of value, and you don't have to worry about being tapped down to deal with opponents on future turns. Notice that I also said sorceries. You don't want to just play instants in this deck. There are ramp spells, fork spells, other types of spells that are at sorcery speed that it's okay to play. As long as the main density of your deck consists of instants, the deck will function super well. So stay tuned for a future deck tech on Kalamax coming very soon. Next up, we've got Zyrus, the Writhing Storm. He has two green, blue, red for a 3-5 legendary creature, Snake Leviathan. He's got flying, and he reads, whenever an opponent draws a card, except the first one they draw in each of their draw steps, create a 1-1 one, one green snake creature token. Whenever Zyrus, the Writhing Storm, deals combat damage to a player, you and that player each draw that many cards. Now, when first looking at Zyrus, my thought was that you really wanted to play a lot of group hug type draw, effects like Howling Mine, Dictative, Crucifix, and Kami of the Crescent Moon, allowing your opponents to draw cards 
taking advantage of that and creating tokens. Now, you don't wanna give them so much advantage over having those cards, so you need to really pack a lot of punch in this deck to make sure that you're taking the most advantage off of this. Now, it's not gonna be like a Nekusar deck where you're damaging your opponents for drawing cards. We do have cards like Fevered Vision in this deck that can do that effect, but since we're in Teamer, our goal is to make a lot of tokens and abuse those tokens by having mass pump effects, giving them infect, or just a lot of token abusing shenanigans. Cards that I would put into this deck are cards like Parallel Lives, which double all of the tokens that you're making with Zyrus. Beastmaster Ascension, that is an excellent win con with all of your little 1-1 green snakes. Skull Clamp, which allows you to draw off of your little 1-1s. A lot of wheel effects that allow you to just create tons of 1-1s without giving your opponents too much of an advantage. And cards like Ashnod's Altar that allow you to take advantage of those tokens that you're creating. A large benefit to playing a lot of pump spells in this deck is that you can play those pump spells on Zyrus so that when he connects, he's dealing even more damage and allowing you to draw that many cards. Something that else that you could put into this deck is the Narset from War of the Spark that stops your opponents from drawing cards, allowing you to draw cards off of Zyrus without giving your opponents that advantage. You are not creating snakes, but you are getting a ton of advantage off of Zyrus by drawing that many cards. Another really good card to put in here is Edric, Spymaster of Trest. He is one green blue for a 2-2. Legendary creature Elf Rogue, whenever a creature deals combat damage to one of your opponents, its controller may draw a card. Now with this, with all the 1-1 snakes that you're making, you can use those to get advantage by drawing more cards, and also when your opponents attack other opponents, drawing them cards, you're creating more snakes as well. The finishers and win cons that I would put into this deck are cards like Crater Hoof Behemoth, Finale of Devastation, Triumph of the Hordes, and Enray's Forerunners which are large mass pump effects that pump up your whole team. Triumph of the Hordes giving them infect to make sure that you can close out the game with all of your tokens. Next up, we've got the first of the partner with cycle with Halden, Avid Arcanist, and Paco, Arcane Retriever. Halden is a two and a blue legendary human wizard with the ability partner with Paco, Arcane Retriever. And that says, when this creature enters the battlefield, target player may put Paco into their hand from their library, then shuffle. Now, if these are your commanders, you cannot put Paco from the command zone into your hand. He also says you may play non-creature cards from exile with fetch counters on them if you exiled them, and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast those spells. Now, how do you get cards into exile with fetch counters? So that's where Paco comes into play. Paco, Arcane Retriever, is three red and green for a legendary creature elemental hound. He has haste, and whenever he attacks, you exile the top card of each player's library, and you put a fetch counter on them. And for each non-creature card exiled this way, ha uh, Paco gets a plus one, plus one counter. So to make this effective, you have to have Halden and Paco in play, because one without the other can't really do anything. I guess Paco, Paco can be swinging every turn and getting cards into exile, but if I were playing this deck, I would probably try to cast Paco first, exile a bunch of cards, and then bring Halden in and try and take some value off of them. You can't always control what your opponents are playing, but in this deck, I would try my best to only play cards that I could hit with Halden and Paco. I'd like to limit the amount of dead cards off the top of our library for their ability so you get the most out of it. In addition to playing lots of spells that you can hit off the top with these guys, I would also be playing lots of ways of protecting these two. The strategy is a little bit fragile just because if one of them gets removed, the strategy kind of ceases. Like if Halden dies, all of a sudden you're left with all of these cards in exile that you can't cast. A thing to note, when Halden comes back into play or if he's ever removed, you can still cast those spells later because Halden only checks to see if the cards in exile have the counters on them. You can even still cast them if Paco leaves the battlefield. That's another thing to note. Moving on to the Ruthless Regiment Commanders. First off, we've got the face commander, Jirina Kudro. Karina is one red, white, black for a 3-3 legendary creature human soldier. And she reads, when Jirina Kudro enters the battlefield, create a 1-1 white human soldier creature token for each time you've cast a commander from the command zone this game. She also reads, other humans you control get plus two, plus oh. So this strategy is Mardo humans. The goal of this deck is gonna be making a lot of humans and a lot of ways of being able to recur humans to get the most advantage off of going wide and pumping up your humans with Jirina. Cards that I would play in this deck are token makers such as Gather the Town Folk, which is one and a white for a sorcery to put two one one white human creature tokens onto the battlefield, and also has Fateful Hour. If you have five or less life, put five of those tokens onto the battlefield instead. Increasing Devotion, which is three white white for a sorcery that also creates five one one white human creature tokens and then you can also flashback it to create 10. Hero of Precinct 1, which is one in a white for a human warrior. Whenever you cast a multicolored spell, create a 1-1 white human creature token. 
And then I'll also be playing a lot of pump spells in this deck. Things like Intangible Virtue, which is one white for an enchantment. Creature tokens you control get plus one plus one and have vigilance. Dictate of Heliod is an enchantment that for three white white, it has flash and creatures you control get plus two plus two. Banalish Marshal, which is white, white, white for a creature that says other creatures you control get plus one plus one. And then with Jarena, when you've created so many tokens and you have those buffs onto the battlefield, then you can cast Jarena, give them all plus two plus O, oh, and go wide and try to take out your opponents with your humans. Some other really good cards I would put in here are Angel of Glory's Rise. She is five white, white for a four, six angel with flying. When it enters the battlefield, exile all zombies and return all human creature cards from your graveyard to the battlefield. Angel of Jubilation, one white, white, white for a 3-3 three, three creature angel, flying. Other non-black creatures you control get plus one, plus one. And players can't pay life or sacrifice creatures to cast spells or activate abilities. Some really good payoff cards in this deck would be cards like Ashnon's Altar and Skull Clamp, which give you a lot of advantage off of creating tokens. The next legendary creature from the Mardu deck is Kelsian the Plague. He costs a red, a white, and a black, and he is a legendary creature human assassin. He has Vigilance and Haste, and Kelsian the Plague gets plus one plus one for each experience counter you have. He has an activated ability that reads tap. Kelsian deals one damage to target creature you don't control. When that creature dies this turn, you get an experience counter. So essentially, he gets bigger for all of the creatures that he assassinates. I kind of feel like it's a lot of hoops to jump through just to get Kelsian a little bit stronger. Like you could obviously give him death touch so he is a free kill spell. And that could be pretty powerful, but you're basically just getting a one for one every time. And you already have to see another card to give him death touch. There are, and there are ways, there are numerous ways of giving him death touch. I think there's another way that could be a little bit more impactful. If I were to build this deck, I would put in effects like Dark Steel Plate, which is an equipment that costs three, and it gives the equipped creature indestructible, in addition to being an indestructible artifact itself. Cards like Gift of Immortality, which is an aura for two and a white, that essentially gives a creature indestructible. It, the creature will die, but it will come back to the battlefield after it, at the beginning of the next end step. And that's not a big deal for Kelsian, because no matter how many times he dies or comes back onto the battlefield, he will always see those experience counters. And then Shielded by Faith is another really good card of giving Kelsian the Plague indestructible. And there are lots of other ways of giving him indestructible. Once he's gotten indestructible, I would play a ton of board wipes. And I know that might not be the most fun thing for your opponents, but it could be very, very, very effective. If you are wiping the board every couple of turns with Kaya's Wrath or Wrath of God or Cleansing Nova, these are just a bunch of really good, efficient board wipes, and you can tap Kelsian to just ping one creature before the board wipe resolves, and he will, and you will be getting an experience counter for that. And after you've wiped the board a bunch of times and you're left with a very strong Kelsian, you could be able to, you could close out the games with that. You could also play, if you're going along the death touch route, you could also play Thornbite Staff, which is an artifact equipment that costs two and four to equip. And it gives a creature that it's equipped to pay two and tap it. This creature deals one damage to target creature or player. We're not super interested in that. Kelsian can already do that. But it also has, whenever a creature is put into a graveyard from play, you can untap this creature. So if Kelsian has death touch, you can ping a creature, untap Kelsian, ping another creature, untap Kelsian, and you can one by one wipe out every single creature on the battlefield and get Kelsian super huge and, and hopefully start killing some opponents with commander damage. Next up, we've got the partner commanders for this deck. We've got Trin, Champion of Freedom, and Silvar, Devourer of the Free. Trin is three and a white for a three three legendary creature human soldier partners with silvar and at the beginning of your end step if you attack this turn create a one one white human soldier creature token silvar is three black red for a four two legendary creature cat nightmare with menace sacrifice a human put a plus one plus one counter on silvar devourer of the free it gains indestructible until end of turn so this deck is definitely more of an aristocrat style deck you have a sack on Silvar that applies to humans. However, it does not cost anything to activate, which means if you have a lot of humans, you can sacrifice them to give it indestructible, and you're also gonna give it a lot of plus one, plus one counters this way. The way that I would build this deck is playing a lot of humans and a lot of aristocrat style cards since you're in the Mardu colors, which means they have a lot of access to drain effects like Falconrath Noble, Blood Artist, Zulaport Cutthroat, and Vindictive Vampire. Another way you could go about this deck is just simply playing a Voltron style by just sacrificing humans to give Silvar that pump to give him indestructible and also play other auras and enchantments that make him a lot bigger. Since he does have menace, he does have a keyword that makes him harder to block. And you can also give him unblockable with different enchantments. All right, now we're going into the commanders from the Abzan Symbiotic Swarm deck. First up, we're going to talk about Cathriel Aspect Warper. It costs two, a white, a black, and a green, and it is a legendary creature nightmare insect. 
and it says, when Cathriel Aspect Warper enters the battlefield, put a flying counter on any creature you control if a creature card in your graveyard has flying. Repeat this process for first strike, double strike, death touch, hexproof, indestructible, lifelink, menace, reach, trample, and vigilance. You then put a plus one plus one counter on Cathriel for each counter put onto a creature this way. Now, one of the new mechanics in Ikoria, Lair of Behemoths, is they came out with keyword counters. Keyword counters being a little bit self-explanatory, but is a counter that you put onto a creature and that creature now has a keyword associated with that counter. You can now give vanilla creatures keywords with these types of counters, or you can add keywords to a creature with already some other keywords and make them a better creature. It's all about making your creatures a lot better and a lot more effective than they were before. If I were to build a Cathriel Aspect Warper deck, I would try and balance it out between a self mill and reanimator strategy, putting as many creatures in that start putting cards into my graveyard, and then putting in lots of cards that help me get cards out of my graveyard back onto the battlefield. Cards like Meyer Triton, Stitcher Supplier, cards like Grizzly Salvage, and other cards with dredge, which instead of drawing a card, you can put that many cards from the top of your library into your graveyard, and then you can return the dredge card back to your hand. I would also try and put, obviously, a lot of creatures with keywords into the deck. Cards like cards like the gods from the Theros set, Erebos, Heliod, Nylea. Another interesting thing is Cathriel gets a plus one plus one counter for each type of counter that you put onto a creature. So if you've got a bunch of creatures with keywords in the graveyard and Cathriel enters the battlefield, you can put all 11 of them on Cathriel and all of a sudden you've got a 14-14 big old bug with all of those abilities. And unfortunately it doesn't have haste, but you are swinging with that on the next turns and you'll probably close out the game pretty fast with all that evasion. We have Tyam, Luminous Enigma. He is one white, black, green for a 3-3 legendary creature nightmare beast. He reads each other creature creature you control enters the battlefield with an additional vigilance counter on it. And for three generic, remove three counters from among creatures you control, put the top three cards of your library into your graveyard, then return a permanent card with convert mana costs three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. A couple of things this card that are super unique. Number one, the cost for Tyam's ability to remove three counters. It is three generic mana, which gives you a lot of flexibility into dumping a ton of mana into this. If you find a way of making infinite mana, then you can just completely mill your entire deck. It also reads you can return a permanent card with convert mana cost 3 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield, which means you can use this in different instances by returning artifacts, enchantments, creatures, and even lands. But do keep in mind that they do have to be of convert mana cost 3 or less. A lot of this deck is going to be revolving around reanimator and aristocrat style strategies by playing a lot of things that create tokens, such as Slimefoot the Starway, which is a legendary creature for one green black that creates sapperlings. Bitter Blossom, at the beginning of your upkeep, you lose one life and create a 1 1 fairy token. You could even use this deck as a strategy for different tribes. You could use this to do a elf tribe by just getting a lot of elves onto the battlefield, giving them all vigilance, being able to take those vigilance counters away to be able to return your key creatures from your graveyard to your battlefield. Another really cool effect in this deck is by adding creatures with persist and undying. Cards like Micaeus the Unhallowed, which give all of your creatures undying, and Cauldron of Souls, which can give your creatures persist, allows you to be able to remove those counters, either when they're plus one plus one counters from undying or minus one minus one counters from persist, remove those counters for time's ability to be able to reuse their undying or persist triggers again. The win condition in this deck simply revolves around this fact that you're basically using that synergy of returning things to kind of outvalue your opponents in the long game. Win the battle of attrition, you can also have a lot of aristocrat style triggers such as the blood artist and zulaport cutthroats and you can also just reanimate huge creatures from your graveyard by just putting them into your graveyard and using reanimate spells to bring them back super good cards in this deck are cards like animate dead and dance of the dead which are enchantments which do consider themselves permanents that are three or less to be able to return big creatures from your graveyard to the battlefield by playing them with time we have a another partner with pair and this one I'm the most excited about and probably the most likely to build. We've got Nikara, Lair Scavenger, and Yannick, Scavenging Sentinel. Nikira is two and a black for a legendary creature human cleric. She has Menace, and whenever another creature you control leaves the battlefield, if that creature had one or more counters on it, you draw a card and you lose one life. And Yannick costs two, a green and a white, and he has Vigilance, and when he enters the battlefield, you exile another creature you control until Yannick leaves the battlefield. When you do, distribute X plus one plus one counters among any number of target creatures where X is the exiled creature's power. I really like these creatures because you don't need to have both of them on the battlefield to take advantage of their abilities, but they get really, really, really good when they're on the battlefield together. 
If I were to build around this deck, I would try my best to abuse Yannick's Enter the Battlefield trigger. Being able to exile a creature you control until he leaves the battlefield could allow for some really cool shenanigans with ETB effects on really powerful creatures, such as Avenger of Zendikar, which for five a green and a green, when it enters the battlefield, you create a sapling token equal to the number of lands you control. So you can theoretically play Avenger of Zendikar, make a bunch of sapling tokens, cast Yannick, exile the Avenger of Zendikar, and then distribute the plus one plus one counters on all of your sapperlings, which if those sapperlings ever die, which they probably will, Nikara will see them leave the battlefield and draw you all those cards. You will be losing all that life, but it's totally worth it for the card draw. I would also play other cards that make tokens like Fungal Sprouting, which is three and a green. You can make X sapling tokens where X is the greatest power among creatures you control. So if you are playing some super big creatures, you are paid off with a bunch of tokens. Cards like Creaking Liege, which every turn makes you a worm and Creaking Liege gives you our black creatures plus one plus one and your green creatures plus one plus one and tender shoot dryad which at the beginning of each upkeep you get to make a sapling token and those tokens are going to get plus two plus two if you have the city's blessing which is super easy to get controlling 10 permanents in a deck like this is not hard at all i would also play cards like peer which he if he sees a counter being placed on a creature you control, it get a second counter. Even cards like Shauna, Sisse's Legacy, which gets plus one, plus one for each creature you control could be awesome because if Yannick exiles her, you're gonna get a lot of counters to distribute among your creatures. I'd also play cards like Shalai, Voice of Plenty, which is an angel that gives all of your other creatures, you and your planeswalkers, hexproof. And late game, you can pump mana into her, Paying six mana, you can put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. I'd also play blink effects like Thalidar Guardian and Charming Prince, because another thing to note, the creatures don't need to die for Nikara to let you draw a card. They just have to leave the battlefield. So if you play those blink effects, even like Eerie Interlude, blink all your creatures, let them re-enter, you're gonna get a ton of value off of that. Moving on, we're going to the Timeless Wisdom Commanders. First off, we've got Gavi Nest Warden, who is two blue, red, white for a two, five legendary creature human shaman. She reads you may pay zero rather than pay the cycling cost of the first card you cycle each turn. And whenever you draw your second card each turn, create a two, two red and white dinosaur cat creature token. The ability to be able to cycle your cards for free on each turn allows you to be able to really cycle through your deck very fast and very efficiently and also get advantage by creating two twos off of her ability. Powerful cards that I would play in this deck are cards like Mystic Remora, which is an enchantment for one, that whenever your opponents cast a non-creature spell, they may pay four. If they don't, you draw a card. Alms Collector, which is three and a white for a three, four cat cleric with flash. And if opponent would draw two or more cards and said you and that player each draw one card, and then I'd be playing also just a lot of other instants and sorceries that allow you to draw cards, not only on your turn, but on your opponent's turn. I would include lots of cycling cards in this deck. Cards like Chasm Skulker for two and a blue, a one, one squid horror. Whenever you draw a card, put a plus one, plus one counter on Chasm Skulker. And whenever it dies, create X, one, one blue squid creature tokens with Island Walk, where X is the number of plus one, plus one counters on Chasm Skulker. Psychosis Crawler, which is an artifact horror for five mana. Its power and toughness are equal to the number of cards in your hand. And whenever you draw a card, each opponent loses one life. Cards like Niv Mizzet Perun for three blue and three red, a five, five legendary creature dragon wizard. This spell can't be countered. It's got flying. And whenever you draw a card, Niv Mizzet deals one damage to any target and whenever a player casts an instant or sorcery spell draw a card there is locust cod in this deck already but i definitely definitely suggest playing this card as it gives you payoff for drawing cards cards like toothy imaginary friend for three and a blue we've got a one one legendary creature illusion whenever you draw a card put a plus one plus one counter on toothy and when toothy leaves the battlefield draw a card for each plus one plus one counter on it now the downside to gavi is that the deck is very heavily centered around cycling the whole point of this deck is to cycle cards out just gain a lot of advantage off of cycling your cards which means your pull for cards are very narrow you want to play cards that give you advantage off of cycling you want to give you want cards that give you advantage when you draw a card I wouldn't suggest going full on on the tokens that you're creating. I would just simply try to use the synergy off of drawing cards and cycling to find some win conditions, uh, either it be it infinite combos or just powerful spells. But I wouldn't suggest focusing on the 2-2 dinosaur creature tokens that you're making. Next up, we've got Akeem the Soaring Wind. It is a legendary creature bird dinosaur that costs two, a blue, a red, and a white. It has flying, and he says, whenever you create one or more tokens for the first time each turn, create a 1-1 one, one bird creature token with flying. He has an activated ability that I find to be a little overcosted that says, three, a blue, a red, and a white. Creature tokens you control gain double strike until end of turn. At first glance, he doesn't seem really all that great, but you have to look at him as a final win con or a somewhat of an enabler slash engine. What I mean by that is in the Jeskai colors, you have access to a lot of creatures that can make tokens. Cards such as 
Monastery Mentor, Talran, Sky Summoner, Young Pyromancer, Murmuring Mystic, Kaikar, Winds Fury, Metallurgic Summonings. The list goes on and on with creatures or effects that create tokens every time you cast a non-creature spell or instant or sorcery. If you're playing a high density of these cards and a high density of instants and sorceries, a super cool card that you could play is Jeskai Ascendancy. It's an enchantment that costs a blue, a red, and a white. It says whenever you cast a non-creature spell, creatures you control get plus one, plus one until end of turn, and you untap those. And whenever you cast a non-creature spell, you may draw a card, and if you do, discard a card. So this is super cool. Once you've amassed a high density of tokens, maybe 10 to 15, which is not super hard in this deck if you're playing enough cre uh, token makers, you cast a couple of cantrips, pump them up, make them really huge, give them double strike, swing in for the win. You're going to want to play Anointed Procession, which also which gives you even more tokens, or play cards like Dawn of Hope, which is an enchantment that turns your 1-1 birds into angel tokens. I'd also play Luminarch Ascension, which is an enchantment for one and a white that says at the beginning of each end step, if you didn't take any damage, you put a quest counter on Luminarch Ascension. And once you have four quest counters, you can then activate the ability that says for one and a white, you can make a 4-4 angel token. Next up, we've got the partner commanders for this deck. We've got Brawlin, Skyshark Rider, and Shabra as the Skyshark. Brawlin, Skyshark Rider is 3 and a red for a 3-3 legendary creature human shaman. Partner with Shabra as the Skyshark. And whenever you discard a card, put a plus one plus one counter on Brawlin, and it deals one damage to each opponent. He also has an ability for one red. Target Shark gains trample until end of turn. Then we have the shark that this is targeted towards. We have Shabraz the Sky Shark, three white blue for a 3-3 three, three legendary creature shark bird with flying, partners with Brawlin. Whenever you draw a card, put a plus one plus one counter on Shabraz the Sky Shark and you gain one life. And for white blue hybrid, target human gains flying until end of turn. I gotta be honest with you guys, this pair doesn't excite me too much. I, I really tried to rack my brain to see what kind of build around I can make with this, but the, the best that I could think of is that you, you could play a lot of discard effects, including wheels, um, Cathartic Reunion, Thrill of Possibilities, which will just allow you to discard cards and it will allow Brawlin to ping your opponents. I don't think there's enough effects like that to be able to make it viable to use this as a win condition. However, if you use that to be able to just take your opponents down to a lower life total and then use Brawlin and Shabraz with their high power since you're drawing a lot of cards and discarding a lot of cards, then possibly this is viable. The ceiling for this pair is that if you have both of them on the battlefield and you're playing effects like Wheel of Fortune, effects like Windfall and you're able to discard a bunch of cards and draw a bunch of cards. That means both Brawlin and Shabraz will get lots of plus one plus one counters. You can give your Shark Trample, uh, Brawlin can give Shabraz Trample, and then you can have Shabraz give Brawlin Flying, which means you can have a little bit of leeway into swinging out with these creatures to be able to take out your opponents after you've dealt all that damage. But that's about the highest ceiling that I can see for, for this pair. If you disagree with me, please, I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Please let me know if you think that there's a higher ceiling to Shabras and Brawlin. All right, moving out of the Jeskai deck and onto the Soltai deck, we've got Otrimi the Ever Playful. He costs three, a black, a green, and a blue. He has Trample, and whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, return target creature card with Mutate from your graveyard to your hand. He's also a 6-6, six, six, which is pretty good. He also has a alternate casting cost, which is its Mutate casting cost. For one, a black, a green, and a blue, you can cast this spell for its mutate costs, putting it over or under target non-human creature you own. They mutate into one creature on top, plus all abilities from underneath it. This mechanic is a little complex and not a lot of people really understand how it works right now because the set is so new. We don't know all the logistics of how it interacts with all the different cards in Magic, but essentially, you keep track of what the creature is by whatever whichever creature is on top. So if you put Otrimi on top of another non-human creature, it will get all of the abilities, all the activated, all the static abilities of the creature underneath, and it will also get all the counters on the creature underneath, but you use the name of Otrimi and the power and toughness of Otrimi or whichever card is on top. So what is the point of mutating? What, what benefit do you get out of that? Well, as you'll see in the Ikoria set, there are a lot of creatures that do something when they're mutated. So when a creature mutates, both creatures, the creature on bottom and on top, will be mutating. One of the problems with mutate is once the creature dies, you're going to lose both of the creatures. And so it's a little bit risky to be playing a bunch of them, but with Otrimi, you can kind of hedge against that negative impact. So whenever he deals combat damage, you're going to get a mutate card, a mutate creature card back from your graveyard into your hand. Now the narrowness of this strategy is a little bit unfortunate. 
However, there are a lot of interesting lines of play with the mutate cards that exist. And we're gonna talk about a lot more of those mutate cards in the part of the set review where we go over the other cards in the commander deck. But I, I think that having a commander that can get your mutate cards back into your hand is super useful, especially because you won't have to be, you won't have to put as many cards into your deck that will do that. So that kind of retains the card quality of the deck. The next one, which I'm very excited about is Xara the Exemplary. He has one black, green, blue for a two, three legendary creature nightmare Hydra with death touch and an ability that says tap, add two mana of any one color. Also, whenever you cast a spell with an X in its mana cost, create a 0, zero green Hydra creature token, then put X plus one plus one counters on it. Now, there are two really cool things in this deck. Number one, I just wanted to go through the whenever you cast a spell with an X in its mana cost phrase. This effect, having the Metallurgic Summonings style wording on a commander, means whenever you're playing that X spell, you're getting an extra creature off of it. That gives so much advantage off of playing a lot of X spells. There's a lot of Hydras that have X in their mana cost, cards in blue and black that also have a lot of X in their mana costs. Things like Blue Sun Zenith, which for blue, 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 X, target player draws X cards. Torment of Hailfire, which is black, black, X for a sorcery, repeat the following process X times. Each opponent loses three life unless that player sacrifices a non-land permanent or discards a card. Estanguinate, which is black, black, X for a sorcery. Each opponent loses X life and you gain life equal to the life lost this way. Green Sun's Zenith, which is green and X. Search your library for a green creature card with converted mana cost X or less, put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library, shuffle Green Sun Zenith into its owner's library. All of these very powerful X spells allow you to be able to, number one, just use Xara to ramp into lots of land, lots of mana dorks to be able to cast these big X spells, and when you cast these X spells, you're getting massive Hydras along with them. Two of the best cards in this deck, number one, is Unbound Flourishing for Tuna Green and Enchantment. Whenever you cast a permanent spell with a mana cost that contains X, double the value of X. And whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell or activate an ability, if that spell's mana cost or that ability's activation cost contains X, copy that spell or ability, you may choose new targets for the copy. This is a phenomenal card in this deck that's just gonna be able to give those X spells that are massive and create a lot of advantage for you and double them and also create massive Hydras along with it. Another card in this deck that allows you to create infinite blue mana. There's actually two in this slot. One is Freed from the Real. For two and a blue, we have an enchantment, enchant creature. For a blue, you can tap enchant a creature. And for blue, you can untap enchant a creature. Putting this on Zaxara means that you can tap him to add two blue into your mana pool. Use one of that blue to untap him and then tap him again. This allows you to put infinite mana of any color to allow you to cast your X spells or just create a game ending play. Similar to Freed from the Real, we have Pim's Aura, which is one blue blue for an enchant creature. For a blue, you can untap Enchanted Creature. For a blue, Enchanted Creature gains flying until end of turn. And for a blue, Enchanted Creature can't be the target of spells or abilities this turn. You can also pay one generic Enchanted Creature gets plus one, minus one, or minus one, plus one until end of turn. So it has that same untap clause, which allows you to use Zixara to untap itself since it's creating two mana. This is an exceptionally powerful card and a very fun deck. This is also going to be one that we're going to build building a deck tech off of upcoming soon. All right, last up for the legendary creatures, we have the last partner with Cycle with Kazur, Ruthless Stalker, and Ukima, Stalking Shadow. Kazur is three and a green for a legendary creature human warrior. Whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, put a plus one plus one counter on that creature. And Ukima is one, a blue, and a black for a legendary creature whale wolf. He has the abilities Ukima Stalking Shadow can't be blocked, and when Ukima leaves the battlefield, it deals X damage to target player and you gain X life where X is its power. I like this pair a little more than some of the others because you don't have to have both of them on the, on the battlefield to get the benefits of their abilities. They just get a lot better when you have them both. Obviously, Ukima is unblockable, and with Kazura, every time Ukima deals damage, he's going to be getting stronger and stronger. And even if Ukima gets really big and your opponents kill him, they're going to be punished for that as well. Hydra's Growth is a super cool card that I'd play in this deck. It's two and a green for an aura that says when Hydra's Growth enters the battlefield, you get to put a plus one plus one counter on the enchanted creature. And at the beginning of your upkeep, you double the number of plus one plus one counters on enchanted creature. So if I were building this deck, I would obviously go the plus one plus one counter route, playing as many creatures and uh, spells and abilities that put plus one plus one counters on my creatures, and then maybe even sacrifice outlets for once 
Ukima gets so big that it can one shot somebody because if it gets that big, maybe somebody's not gonna wanna kill it. Or if it gets really big and it can kill a very threatening player, you can kind of use that politically and have one of your opponents kill it, making the deal that you'll kill the most threatening player at the table. There's some political aspects to it. And if you give it infect, like with anything, it gets super strong because it itself is dealing the damage. And with that, we have talked about and covered all of the legendary creatures in C20. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you maybe got some inspiration to build some of these commanders and make the deck your own. And if we missed anything that is super relevant or maybe interesting or lines of play with any of these legendary creatures, feel free to leave those down in the comment section and let us know what your overall feeling and sentiment is about these legendary creatures. We will be creating quick upgrade guides for each of the face commanders of these products. However, we'll also be creating deck techs for some, maybe not all of the commanders that are coming out. If you want to see a deck tech on one of the commanders that have come out from this commander product, please let us know in the comments. We'd be happy to see what we can do. So far, we've got a couple that we're really excited for that we're already working on. And with that, that's it for our first part of this Commander 2020 review. Next episode, we will be talking about the important cards in the 99 of these decks, including new cards. We won't be going over the reprints or lands. We're just going to be talking about the new cards that we think are powerful or in Commander. Thank you guys so much for watching or listening. We appreciate everything that you guys do for us. If you haven't already, please like, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and ring that bell for notifications of all of our future videos. And with that, that's all we have for you guys. We'll see you next time.